for our program this evening. The topic, Arlington's infrastructure, what do we need and how do we pay for it? So our community infrastructure is all around us. We use it every day. We came here on county roads and some of us in public buses. The local electric grid is lighting this room. Gas and plumbing are responsible for the dinner that we've enjoyed. And if you're watching the recording of this meeting, then you're receiving it via copper or fiber optic cable and probably through an, in through an internet infrastructure that connects the entire world. In a recent program about immigration, I remarked that citizenship is a bit like air. You have it all around you and you only notice it when it's not there. And I think we can say the same for infrastructure. We completely depend on it, but we are most keen to notice it when it fails us. Now, sometimes our challenges are short-term and circumstantial. I've understood that our Department of Environmental Services call center has been quite overflowing in the past week as our very cold temperatures have frozen pipes and caused bursts. Sometimes our challenges are long-term. You know, we're all familiar, years of undone maintenance led to a place where metro rail system was frankly unsafe. And even after a year plus of disruptions due to safe check, it's still not back to where it needs to be. And that's just managing what we already have. Demographers estimate that our population will continue to grow. We've grown considerably, and they estimate that we could have 25% more people by 2040, not even mid-century. I've myself been on holiday, traveling about. You see people, you introduce yourself, where are you from? I'm from Northern Virginia, and they give the standard response, oh man, I-66. <laughs> and then I reply, oh, that's nothing compared to the orange crush. <laughs> and in too many cases, we struggle to handle what we're having now. How are we going to go forward from there? And then complicating everything is that these needs are all happening at the same time, and money does not grow on trees. There are questions about the attractiveness of municipal debt financing, our traditional vehicle, as a result of the new federal tax law, concerns that the limitations on the deductibility of state and local taxes are going to make us perhaps a little less keen to pay the taxes required to service to debt. The president has mentioned on a number of occasions going back to his campaign, a local infrastructure improvement program, but it remains unclear what, if any, form that will take. Public-private partnerships have arisen as an alternative uh, where the government grants a private company the right to charge for use of an asset in exchange for the responsibility of maintaining it. These arrangements do offer the public a measure of protection from both upfront and maintenance costs but do add the complexity of having an owner seeking return on investment. Changes the dynamic, changes the relationship. So where are we, where are we now? Where are we going? And how are we going to pay for it? We've invited two speakers who know much more than I do about this to give us some enlightenment. And Mike Moon, who is the department's chief operating officer, is joining us this evening. As COO, Mike manages daily operations, program and project execution, emergency management, constituent relations, and emerging issue management. Prior to being named COO, he served as deputy director of operations. And before coming to Arlington, Mike led the city of Manassas Public Works and Utilities Department. Next, Jen Mayer will join us. Jen is a nationally recognized expert in developing and implementing creative financial solutions for infrastructure projects. During her career, which includes stints at the Federal Highway Administration, Ernst & Young, and others, she has focused on leveraging partnerships amongst agencies, industry and academia, and nonprofits to advance the state of knowledge on public-private partnerships. So she can tell you if what I just said was right or not. In addition to her own research and presentations, she's coordinated and moderated numerous seminars and training sessions on public-private partnerships and has recently started her own uh, firm uh, concept generation, ge generations built with a JEN, which I think is super creative. Also, Jen grew up here in Arlington and is very much a member of our extended committee of 100 family. Her father, James, stood right here back in the mid 90s. And so we are so excited to have both of our speakers here. And without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Mike Moon.
Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's my privilege to be here tonight. I wanted to give you a little bit of information on Arlington County's infrastructure. Um, I, I think it's just a snapshot. We'll have time for questions at the end of this, but uh, I want to run through a couple of slides here. Um, first, our DES is a, is a com combination of transportation and, and, and traditional public works inside of Arlington County. Um, this is our vision. Um, we want to make Arlington a leading community that is vibrant, accessible, and resilient. And our core to what we do is, is um, maintaining Arlington's utility, facility, and transportation infrastructure, and also our environmentally, from an environmental perspective, that natural built environment. Um, this is some information about the infrastructure that we maintain, and as was alluded to earlier, <clears throat> at the top was water mains. Um, I think that's a, a, a very significant um, piece of infrastructure. Um, over 60% of, of Arlington's water mains are over 50 years old. Um, we invest in that um, at about a rate of 2 to 3% um, a year as part of our capital improvement program. Um, about 75% of our, our cast, mains are cast iron, which today we replace them with a lot more resilient and uh, less brittle material, um, so they don't break as much is what it means to, to our customers. What's important about our water service is not only is it important to be cost effective, it has to be reliable. As customers, if you turn on your spigot, it doesn't flow, we have an issue, and you're disappointed. So we try to keep that at the forefront. Um, as, as was said, we had, since November, we've had 64 water breaks. Um, on an average year, we'll have about 181 water breaks. Particularly this cold snap, we were out this past weekend. In the last, uh, last week, we had over 100 uh, water services or water meters that were frozen. And so that's a constancy of effort to maintain our service to our customers. And a big part of that is having maintained infrastructure that helps us deliver that service. Um, some other statistics you see here. Um, I would note that the 23 million gallons of water used per day comes from the Washington Aque Aqueduct, the Del Carlia um, facility that's across, uh, across the river in D.C. Um, that provides the water. We do have interconnect capability with Fairfax County water to the west. Um, and we're continuing to invest in that interconnection so that we have some redundancy in our, our water system. Uh, the only other thing I would mention, is you can see the transportation infrastructure that's in that second tier. Um, we do have 1,050 uh, lane miles of roadways. We're only one of two counties, Henrico and Arlington, uh, that maintain their actual road, secondary road system. So that's unique to our county infrastructure, um, and that, that decision has made us have allowed us to have more flexibility in the development and in our capital projects. We have a lot more flexibility in what we can what we can do. Um, and then two million square foot of, of facilities maintained by by DES. Uh, maintaining and improving our infrastructure is part of the the capital improvement program. Um, I do. I'll just put a teaser out there for you. Uh, we're currently in the throes. Every two years, we revise that. It's a book that's very thick. Um, it represents significant um, community investment, um, and it's paid for by you all and by our, by our citizens and businesses and our constituents. Um, I think in that blue box, you'll see parks, libraries, transportation, community centers, facilities, technology, water sewer infrastructure, and stormwater. If any of those are, are, are a special um, interest areas for you, that you'd like to lend advocacy to those, um, later in the spring, we'll have opportunities for public input, and you can track that and provide your opinions on what the county is in, in, intending to invest in. Just uh, to name a couple of the programs that fall within our, our portfolio, the utility fund for the county is an enterprise fund. It's supported by user fees. It's a $102 million operating budget. Um, it does provide uh, $14 million of capital that we invest back into our system. Stormwater is... Um, is a, you'll see it's typical stormwater, you would think it's in terms of uh, reducing um, quantity issues or potentially flooding issues within communities and within our road system. But this also, our stormwater fund was actually stood up in large part also to uh, meet environmental compliance required for our MS4 permit that we're regulated on that um, impacts what we actually discharge um, into the Chesapeake Bay. And so that MS4 permit compliance um, really regulates um, what we invest in in the community. Transportation, significant CIP, uh, over a billion dollars of transportation investments. Um, those are multimodal in, in all aspects. Um, we have a complete streets model that we, we look at for our projects. Um, 
there's over uh, significant over 10 years, but I think that's it's got a whole. What's challenging on the on the transportation end is the diversity of funding that we draw from to fund that um, regional, local, PAYGO, bonds, and also a, a plethora of of state and federal funding that make that make that transportation uh, program work. It's highly leveraged. We use uh, county um, dollars to leverage a lot of federal um, components to that program. And then facilities, that varies by the component, but it's a very important part of our program. And we try to take, and especially in the facilities end, is a maintain first principle. You've got to maintain what you have before you build new, and that's an important aspect, and it's often lost because, frankly, maintaining facilities is not always as, as exciting to the public and to elected officials as, um, as your new facilities. Uh, water ma the utility fund. Just noting here, you all pay this. Um, if you're if you have a if you're a customer, you live in the county, you'll pay that thirteen dollars and sixty two uh, cents per thousand gallon of whatever you use through your meter. Um, that goes to help uh, pay for all the costs for operating and maintaining our system, and future efforts there that are significant that that are a, a significant need for us is advanced treatment at the aqueduct. We do conventional treatment currently. We're looking to be able to do a more advanced treatment for different um, components in the water system for, to have the highest quality of water uh, treatment that's possible um, to, to, for, for emerging technologies or for emerging pathogens, Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and other things. That uh, advanced treatment is about a $350 million project. The county shares approximately $60 million. Um, the solids master plan, that's, not, uh, that's solids at our water pollution control plant, so you can use your imagination on what kind of solids that is. Um, but it is a significant um, investment at our plant um, to be able to treat and, and upgrade obsolete equipment. That, that investment um, over the next 10 years is about $140 million. Um, Stormwater, uh, that's supported by a 1.3 cent um, ad valorem tax per hundred on, on the assessed value of real estate on the bill. Um, that is used to do those, uh, those projects that improve water quality runoff and to reduce flooding in communities and on our, in our system, and also to reduce uh, nutrients that are flowing into our, our creeks and into the bay. That's an important regulatory function that, that's regulated by DEQ and EPA. Um, pays, pays for the, a lot of those specifics there, but I think uh, mitigating environmental impacts from uh, what we do as an entity, and especially development. Development has to pay their own way towards that, but this is to help us as a jurisdiction to, to come into compliance and even exceed compliance. Transportation, um, as, we, as, we, as I already said, that's got multimodal, complete streets. Those six elements are part of the um, of projects we look at as we develop a project scoping. Um, complex federal and state local funds allow us to develop the, the CIP, uh, the, the Master Transportation Plan, which has a lot of community involvement, actually helps inform what we are going to do with our CIP investment. It's got uh, very various aspects from transit to bike elements um, to help us guide the investment in the community. I think the uh, one thing with this is we have had additional infusion of dollars, especially at, back in the 2011-12 time frame. We had um, N NVTA, the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, uh, allowed us to gain uh, $12 million of local dollars and then a, a CNI tax of $25 million. But that was mainly plowed into the construction element. So you're lacking perhaps the maintenance element um, of that system that we're developing. So I want to give, this is, I don't know how easy this is to see, but this is just one example. Um, we track performance. We have over 130 uh, performance metrics that we, we track in the department. But one of those is pavement condition index. And one of the reasons we put that out there is the last three citizen satisfaction surveys have told us that streets are one of the number one investments that the community wants to see improved in Arlington. And so you can see back in the 2012 time frame, we lacked investment. We had fallen behind on the, the cost of oil, which is a, a heavy influencer on the cost of asphalt. And we are um, we played catch up, and where we really need to be from a standpoint of of lane miles is 75 lane miles. So from 15 to 17, we are um, playing catch up on that, and our 
our road index um, is, is now at 74.6, where it was much below 60, or much, much below 70. So we track those kind of things, but the lessons learned there is you've got to keep up with maintenance. Facilities, uh, 89 facilities, 2.3 million square feet. Um, we, that's the diversity of the, what we maintain. And current and future challenges, uh, I'm not going to speak to that too specifically, but what you see here is the various um, things that are underway for interim long-term solutions that, that we're, we're dealing with. Uh, part of the JFAC process, which was publicized, is important for us to site needed county facilities. And this is really the last slide I just wanted to point out. Um, it's it's kind of busy, but in 2004, um, we had 120 school buses. Now we have 174. Um, our buses were going from 65 to 90. We need places to put that infrastructure to serve the community. That's one of our biggest challenges in DES is to provide back office space. A lot of our facilities right now are housed at, in Shirlington at the Trade Center, and we're constantly looking for space to be able to provide the needed services to our, to our constituents. And now, Jen Mayer. <laughs> So it's great to be here, although I have to say that speaking in Arlington about government is kind of like speaking about Catholic theology at the Vatican. <laughs> this is where the center is, and you are the best at it. So uh, despite this slight feeling of intimidation uh, and high level in the audience, uh, in honor of my father, who has dearly loved this organization, I'm going to go ahead and get started. But first, a word from sp some sponsors. Um, as you see here, the results of what I'm talking about are based on a project with four cities, uh, sponsored by the City Foundation, Governing Magazine, and a group called Living Cities. We worked with Pittsburgh, St. Paul, San Francisco, and the District of Columbia, looking at infrastructure finance innovation. Now, a lot of people think, let's see if I can get one. A lot of people think finance is boring. I like to say I'm a time traveler. I'm looking into the future for money, for what I need now. And you've all traveled in time to pay for your houses, pay for your educations. Uh, and that's what communities have to do now, look to the future uh, to pay for what you need now. The challenge is that the future is looking a little bit more dire um, so even if we could say that in contrast to economics, which I call the dismal science, finance might be the hopeful art, uh, but we have greater challenges than we've ever had to solve. I'm only going to talk about two of them. The rest of them are included in this document that really uh, encapsulates a lot of the lessons that we learned um, and are still learning from the cities that are doing it right now. Uh, the two ones I'm going to talk about, they'll be reading next time. It's about 90 pages. I'm sure you'll all have mastered it by the time I come back to Arlington. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the two I really want to focus on that I think are most relevant to what uh, Mike uh, was talking about are capital bias, or what I like to call the ribbon versus the broom, and embedding equity in infrastructure, which is something that may or may not have come across your radar screen yet. So let's talk about the ribbon versus the broom. How many of you have been to a ribbon cutting? Well, a lot of you, you're pretty prominent in Arlington. How many of you have been to an operations and maintenance ceremony? <laughs> we don't really do, Mike's been, you know. <laughs> We don't do that. That's not the sexy part. And, and that is a challenge across capital finance. Uh, our job is to design, build, plan, talk to everybody, build it, come up with the money. And then when the project's done, it's supposed to live happily ever after. Uh, the reality is that's not what happens. And so what happens is you have situations like uh, the death spiral that uh, at Metro, where you have long-term capital shortfall. We have a structural deficit in most capital finance agencies. And that results in very, very able engineers like Mike trying to spread the peanut butter thinner and deal with chronic shortages. But there's another problem to this sort of capital bias, and that's that there's a focus on physical facilities rather than the service. People don't want a bridge or a transit station. You want to be able to get home. You don't want pipes. You want water. And uh, we see all these studies that talk about America's crumbling infrastructure and it's $5 trillion in debt um, and we need to fix it all. And maybe we actually don't because um, as the Hummer advertisement says, need is a very subjective word. We don't necessarily need to fix everything, but what we need are the services that are behind it. 
Uh, but if you have a capital bias and you're looking only at succeeding on building capital, or what some people call the edifice complex, so you can get your name on the building, um, then it's not going, you're not going to really uh, focus on the service side. So how have we solved this? I can't say we have, but I do know that there are cities across the country that are looking at different ways. Uh, some of them are looking at energy savings. You can actually finance projects with uh, savings from energy efficiency, HVAC improvements. Um, sometimes you look at these public-private partnerships and that's the real answer is that they're getting operational savings. You're telling them, all right, I don't care how you get me this service, but for 25 years I'll pay you for the service. If you can't get it for me, then I don't have to pay you. Right now the situation is the warranty on your car is longer than the warranty on the road it's driving on. That's a little crazy, isn't it? As soon as an infrastructure project is constructed, you don't really have, they have the money, the company that built it, and you have the obligation as the public agency to maintain and operate it. Uh, so a lot of these public-private partnerships, they're not there because the private sector is bringing money to the table, because of course they expect to be paid back. It's because they're going to be able to um, benefit by um, operating it, building it better in the first place, and maintaining it better. So the next challenge, and I know we have a very short time to talk about all the challenges of infrastructure finance. I did want to address this one because it's something that's not natural. It hasn't come up for us before, but increasingly it's coming up. Um, and all the infrastructure agencies I've been working with, if you don't consider equity on the front end, it's going to clap you on the back end, essentially. Um, infrastructure improvements in Arlington and everywhere else have been historically inequitable. We see that Interstate 395 and the Pentagon were built in low income and communities of color, and that's our legacy. And as we go forward, as we've tried to do better for many years, infrastructure agencies have succeeded in building great infrastructure, but that infrastructure creates benefits that aren't evenly distributed. distributed. Um, so you have a situation where maybe you build a great transit station or the High Line in, in New York or the Belt Line in Atlanta or some of the great resources. For the landowners and property owners there, it's a great benefit because your property value is going to go up. For a renter there, it may be the, um, the signal that you're going to get a rent increase and you're not going to be able to live there anymore. So even in an economically distressed area, which not much of Arlington is anymore, but, um, but you have a situation where lower income people don't necessarily benefit from infrastructure to the degree that higher income people do. So a lot of my cities are exploring ways, how do you bring this incredible value that infrastructure brings to the community back to everyone in the community? Because you have a situation, um, you probably all know the saying, the operation was successful, but the patient died. It's not a successful infrastructure project if you uh, say, oh, I've, I've created a wonderful new community if you changed who lives there. Uh, so in wrapping up, uh, we often talk about infrastructure sort of, if you build it, they will come, right? It's kind of like the field of dreams. You build, you build the project and everything will be great. It worked out in the movie pretty well. Um, but if you build it, will it be for some? is the question we want to ask now. And if you build it, what future will come? Our agencies are being more intentional about making sure that uh, people who live in the communities that they're working on will get the jobs and the training to work on these major projects that will provide support to entrepreneurs of color and low income so that they can actually qualify to work on the projects. Because if you don't have a lot of money, you don't have money for a performance bond. Um, and then also, so even beyond that, so that people beyond property owners can actually take some of the benefit. You know that about a quarter of the land value, a quarter to a half, it varies a lot um, depending on the year, but um, comes from the area around the metro stations in Arlington. Huge value. Some of that could come back to the community in the form of a dividend to the community, just like in Alaska, the people in, the, in Alaska receive a dividend every year based on the natural resources of their community. Well, our infrastructure is part of the public resources of, of this nation, and some of it could go back to the communities that it's coming from. Uh, so those are some of the concepts and ideas we explored in this, um, and I'm expecting in the next round of this work that I will have a case study from Arlington. So look forward to your questions and, and uh, information about in the future. Thanks. <laughs>
So we're now going to go to the question and answer period. Formulate your question to uh, follow the great committee of 100 tradition. And so great a tradition is it that when Jen and I were exchanging emails, getting ready for um, this evening, making sure we had all the logistics nailed down, she wrote to me that she was very eager to come because of the tradition that she said her father always mentioned when he stood in this place to remind everyone, please, to ask your question in the form of a question. Um, and, you know, with that, I, I do, I'll take a brief moment where we're doing pretty well on time just to note why we do that, because um, I've gotten some questions about that. People come up. Um, and it is not that we are not interested in everyone's opinions. Um, I have conversations with many of you before. We all have interesting things to say. Rather, what the Committee of 100 does, I, I think, and what we do really well, is we use an interrogative process to distill out the best ideas, that we bring uh, speakers with expertise, and we ask them questions. It helps them challenge their assumptions. It helps us helps us challenge our assumptions. And in doing so, makes us better able to engage in the community and in the discussions we're having here. There are many great fora that take more of a state your opinion approach. They're great, go attend them. But that's why we do ask our questions in the form of a question here at Committee 100. And that's enough uh, form of a statement. Let's do some questions. Um, start with Carl. Uh, good evening. My name is Carl Van Newkirk. Uh, a few years ago, we had a great controversy in this community over mass transit along Columbia Pike. Could you update us on that, please? The, the county has been updating the TDP, the Transportation Development Plan, along Columbia Pike. Um, the, it's part of the CIP. That, that is an investment. Um, we're right currently, um, one of the projects being deployed is the, the, the new bus stops along Columbia Pike. We're currently looking at um, replacing a metro um, service uh, along Columbia Pike with art service. Uh, and well, metro will be doing some additional service there too. So that's a constancy of effort that uh, that has been part of the TDP. And, and so they're looking to deploy that. And I think the investment in the new CIP will reflect some of the additional um, strategies, if you would, for that investment over the next uh, more immediate term, five, three to five years. But I think uh, it's it's a very important priority for the county, as you, as you relayed, and uh, we're, we're continuing to look at that from from the aspects all around of bus stops, um, what we're doing on the Columbia Pike projects themselves. We have a significant over a hundred million dollar investment in Columbia Pike, as far as uh, re regrading and redeveloping the road system with underground utilities. So it's it's really a a, a multi pronged approach to try to improve Columbia Pike itself. With the transit there, though, that's that's really something that we're we're trying to r roll out specific investments in the next three to five years as part of that. Scott, uh, I'm Scott Sklar, and aside from being president of the Ashen Heights Civic Association, I teach two sustainability infrastructure courses at George Washington University, Excellent. and have a business that does that after disasters. Been to Puerto Rico, Florida, Texas. So the question is, because I'm told by Scott I have to ask a question. The question is, and it's to both of you, why does not Arlington County integrate on-site renewable energy and storage that the private sector can finance? So not only is it lower cost than buying it from the utility, but it's 100% resilient, rather than relying on diesel engines, which always crap out during these disasters. That is my question to you both. Thank you. Well, Jen, you're probably able to answer that better, but I'll take a stab. <laughs> um, I, I do think from a, um, we do have a, um, uh, an office of sustainability and, in, and energy part of our um, I that yeah and so John Morrell has been actively working on that so you've worked with John yeah. uh, I do think what we have to look at on some of those I mean whether it's battery technology whether it's what kind of storage specifically but we do um, from a stewardship standpoint we do have to look at what the ROI is for each of those investment opportunities and I think that's if you've been part of that process in the community energy plan We've had to revamp and 
it revamp and readjust as as the technology is evolving and so that's something that we have to continually do so i can tell you this is our staff is constantly looking at those opportunities whether it be storage whether it be solar whatever it is whether it's a microgrid the county is constantly looking at those opportunities um, i think one of the things we have a challenge on right now is the low cost of energy um, that we pay here as opposed to say the west coast i mean we have very low cost of you know the dominion energy rates are are low and so uh especially with the advent of frac shale who knows how long that'll last so there's a there's a financial aspect to that that i think has driven a lot of it but jen I, I would agree with, uh, I mean, around the country we see that areas like energy and technology have been the slowest uh, or the most difficult for cities to manage because they're so fast moving and city processes by nature and by design are not. You don't want people going out there and making commitments for 15 and 30 years um, in a way that a private company which can walk away. My wife negotiates these kinds of energy agreements for uh, Yahoo and Amazon and they can they can afford to do those kind of things because they have the ability as corporations to go bankrupt and go away. Arlington's going to be here, and and so they have um, by design a longer process, and it is a little bit more difficult to figure out what business model is going to work. That being said, your point about um, resiliency in an emergency, what sources? I think that's becoming increasingly important to people and becoming a factor in decision making. I haven't heard it so much on the energy side. Um, there was definitely, if I'd had a chance to put in a third challenge in 10 minutes, um, I would have put in the sort of resiliency challenge that a lot of folks are facing. And there may be a case to be made um, for emergency management and for resiliency that might change how, how it's operated. Hi, my name is Charlotte. And I have a question concerning why are projects in Arlington not funded by Arlington. And this is my concern. Um, I periodically travel on George Mason Drive between Columbia Pike and Foma Run Drive. And if you've ever gone that way, if anybody would be going home tonight, there are no traffic lights on, all the traffic lights or the uh, street, street lights. lights are out. And you have children that live in Barcroft that have to walk to school, the crossing guards there, students that have to walk to Wakefield. So I called, you know, the street light company in Arlington, and I was ended up giving a, a number to call in, um, I think it was in North Carolina. And so I'm on the phone for about an hour with this person who is literally Skyping to see the community that I'm talking about. Well, those street lights that are on George Mason Drive, and there are 11 of them, as I said, that are out, both sides, uh, both directions. Specific question. And she's telling me it's not a Virginia, it's not an Arlington project. I did this in October. She told me it would be at least November, the end of November. Your question, so please. My said, my question is, why are they outsourced? If there are lights in Arlington, aren't they Arlington lights? And I said, can't you get somebody okay. to come and Th look at them? Thank you. That's, so uh, what is our model for that? Yeah, our, that's, a, that's a great question and a frustration that we've heard before. Um, th the county has about 7,150 lights, and Dominion Energy maintains an, an additional about 11,200 lights in the county. So the way our, inf our street lighting infrastructure specifically has developed over time, um, has been that we maintain, Arlington maintains about 40% of the street lights, Dominion Energy has about 60%. So that's, currently we're looking at that through a, a street light master plan process to try to look at um, addressing some of those issues, but there is a, a diversity of the, of the uh, street lights, and it causes problems from a maintenance standpoint, because sometimes people will call, we have a report a problem um, on our website, and some of those have to get forwarded to Dominion Energy to fix. So it is, I guess I can't explain to you the full development of why that occurred over time, but a lot of that was just how the infrastructure developed um, in Arlington County. And we're trying to deal with that from the standpoint of looking at what makes sense from, an on, from a forward-looking standpoint of looking at perhaps districts even to where in a certain area they would all be maintained by the county and maybe out in the residential areas more dominion. So that's something we're looking at currently, but... Um, that's the answer. It's not the best, but that's where we are. Mm -hmm. Sir. 
Uh, Nate Maurer, and uh, I'm a transportation demand consultant. Uh, so I speak the language. Um, one, uh, there's uh, urban partnership agreements uh, that have been set up throughout the United States. Um, Jen, have you studied those urban partnership agreements and the congestion pricing that has happened along a lot of the interstates um, and have actually seen any sort of equity created within those communities? And then specifically within Arlington, uh, have you thought about studying I-66 inside the Beltway Project? Um, well, since it's not at all controversial, I think it's a... <laughs> oh, yes. No, I, I have, I'm familiar with the urban partnerships for sure, and, you know, that has been come up. Um, anytime you have people paying for solo drivers to enter uh, formerly HOV lane, uh, they branded them initially, or people who opposed them, as Lexus lanes. You know, you're going to pay your way in. I like to call them FedEx lanes. You know, FedEx came to town, it cost you 20 bucks to send an overnight letter. We still don't overnight our bills, no matter how rich you are. It's situational, and what they've found in a lot of these situations that it's not so much the wealthier people that use it, obviously they're more likely to use it, um, but it's really the people that, oh, I'm gonna miss my kid's soccer game, I'm gonna miss my way to the airport, um, it, or I'm a plumber, I wanna make four calls instead of three calls. Uh, so they find that the equity in a lot of situations is better than you would think um, from just looking at, at the situation. But the other equity is really sort of the backwards equity. We don't pay the full cost of driving in this country. You know, all probably know, since you're well-educated and we have 100 members, that we haven't raised the gas tax since 1990. Uh, I graduated from college just after the last gas tax rise. And, you know, it's not... Uh, that cars are paying their full cost now. So to what degree that mode gets fully priced and that some of that money in some communities has gone back to providing bus service along the same corridor, um, that can uh, deliver some equity. Um, it's certainly a concern if all of the energy in congestion management is going into the highway mode and not into the other alternatives. Um, because as we say, we, we really need um, in this country a funding system that's platform neutral. Right now our dollars are divided up into highway and transit and we really have play favorites among and ports get nothing. Um, and so we really play favorites and we really need a system of funding. We need funding increases, gas tax. Even that won't help us because uh, Priuses are uh, coming online and, and we're getting less money every year. Um, so we need another funding model at a national level but we also need to break down the barriers between modes financially so that you can make a decision that keeps everybody moving in the community. And, and I have another question. <laughs> I'll go back at it. Very briefly, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so it's amazing how Arlington County has really uh, become one of the leaders of TDM uh, and TSM uh, you know, uh, over the past uh, that, few that's years. That's travel demand management? And yes, <laughs> and travel, travel, system, travel yes. systems management as well. Yes. Um, especially through the, through the uh, Complete Streets initiative. Uh, looking towards the future, uh, how can Arlington maintain uh, this leadership role in, in the country? Well, I'm excited that Arlington, and I was not familiar until Mike spoke tonight, that you consolidated your environmental and transportation agencies. You are, as usual, ahead of all the other communities. The, the last couple of waves, you, you, uh, cities have merged their transit and highway and streets operations, and then they brought in mobility, maybe the pedestrian and other operations. But Arlington had to go one step further, bring in the environmental folks, so you really have a Department of Public Works that's integrated. Um, Arlington has a legacy of really doing value capture um, in a way that other communities haven't. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the story about how, how I-66, part of the agreement for creating it, was the demand that Metro go along Wilson Boulevard, which really mm -hmm. shaped how Arlington's developed. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's um, part of how Arlington can maintain its leadership is uh, by continuing to focus on uh, long-term thinking. And, and I hope that they'll also uh, show leadership in the equity, um, you know, looking at uh, transportation service in South Arlington and North Arlington and for all communities um, at all income levels. Um, and that's, I hope that that's going to be um, a future uh, area of leadership. And I'm sure there are people working on that now. The only thing I'd say real quick is that uh, the TDM part of that, just continuing to look at the, the uh, multiple multimodal aspects of that from a complete street standpoint and just the transit, how that all interplays. One of the few uh, jurisdictions 
um, I know in the Commonwealth, but nationally, we're, we're, we're counting traffic on, on our uh, commuter bike lanes um, and our uh, trails and doing things like that where we're, we're actually emphasizing the multimodal um, and not just the highway aspects. I mean, that's been traditional Arlington, but to continue to focus on that and let it um, inform our investment strategies going forward. And let me make a, another quick comment. You know, the whole discipline of travel demand management is moving people regardless of platform. <clears throat> Um, and in some other cities, they've done interesting things where they'll um, offer payment. Um, this is actually in California where there's a, a serious air quality concern. They did an RFP process where they offered money to nonprofits and for-profit organizations said, if you can reduce trips, I don't care how you do it, just tell us what cost per trip and if it's a van pool, if it's um, we're going to develop this new uh, private jitney bus service that's going to do this. Um, we'll give you some money. And then they pick in the RFP process. It's like they bid down the cost of the trips every morning um, so that they can reduce the overall travel by solo vehicle in the area. Uh, so some kind of innovations like that might be something we could look at in the future. Katie. Um, this is a question for Mike. Earlier in your topic, you said that Arlington County maintains its own roads. We in Henrico County are the only two counties in the, in the state that do that. Can you offer a little bit more clarification? And you said that it provides flexibility. Why does that provide flexibility? Can you give us a little more clarification on that? Um, I guess from the aspect of, um, well, we, we are reimbursed for that um, in the tune of $19 million annually, but it gives us flexibility from the standpoint of when we're developing a construction project. The, the lead time on construction projects can be anywhere from three to seven years or more, 10 years, depend, pick your project. But it does, we don't have to go through, um, a lot of times for some, some of the roads, we don't have to go through a VDOT review. It's just all internalized. So on the capital side, it's that. On the operational side, um, it's just a lot of difference. Like just one example I'll give you is a permit, a residential permit. It's all one-stop shop inside of Arlington County versus having to go out to get a permit at VDOT. So we control some of those decision-making within. And it's become important, especially with some of the um, creative development and some of those type of things and some things in our capital projects that frankly don't fit into what I call the VDOT ease standards. We've had the ability to maybe uh, um, inject our standards and our philosophy a little bit more because of that control aspect. Now, I would just say for clarity, we don't maintain all the roads, the primaries, the Lee highways, m most of the sections of Washington Boulevard and some of the others are state maintained, but talking about more of the secondary and um, maybe your pr minor principal arterial type roads, that's, those ones we maintain. Mm -hmm. Gail. Hi, I'm Gail Dennis. Um, I would like to know what the county is doing to ensure that the very profitable developers of 100, 200, 300 unit buildings that are going up like at Boston pay for the increased sewers, water mains, um, you, expansion of the processing plant over on East Glebe, East Glebe West Glebe, um, and this type of thing, not only for the year of construction, but also for in the future, even if they sell and s those developments to somebody else, that they include that in their contracts of sale. Yeah, uh, specifically on utilities, um, developers have to pay based on their um, plumbing fixture units um, an availability fee. And that is supposed to capture the long-term capacity need improvements in our system. Now, I will say this, when it comes to a large um, multi-family or, or multi-story development, um, we have to continue to ensure, and it's through a periodic review process, that our cost for availability fees is matching the increased cost of capa new capacity in our system. And so our availability fees need to keep track with what's increasing in our system. And so I would say we have a system that can can take care of your concern as long as we're being vigilant on what the cost of our system capacity is and, and adjusting the fees accordingly. Thank you. Yeah, it, that would be that would be uh, irrespective of who, who gets that unit. It is the capacity of that um, that that unit or those development. Okay. 
Yeah, those those fees are paid up front by the developer, whoever that is. Those are upfront right. trees. Those right? are uh, those are upfront the, fees before that they take can care sell of. it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the Gail was following up on for those who couldn't hear the question on where the fees go from there, but there's the upfront and the maintenance, right. and, and maintenance stays the way it is. More questions, Nicole. Nicole Merlin, um, when you had talked about equity and infrastructure, I actually wasn't thinking about parity. I was thinking about financial equity um, and how do you create financial incentive to invest in infrastructure? And so, you know, not just equity, but a loan structure. And you've seen private investment going into a lot of infrastructure across the country from Texas to New York. Um, and a lot of those, you know, P3 has been very sexy lately. And a lot of those are maturing now in their loans. and. Uh, based on your study that you just did, was that successful? Uh, there are gives and takes, as you can see with the street lights, um, there are benefits and there are co costs. Um, and there are serious costs in a lot of instances on major projects across the country. And have you found on balance that it's been a positive influence on the community to have private financing going into public infrastructure? That is a very good question. and. Uh I'd, I'd like to answer it with an if by whiskey answer, which is back in the time of prohibition when a, a politician went through a town and had a whistle stop and didn't know what the position was. They would say, if by whiskey you mean that terrible thing that ruins people's lives, I'm against it. If I'm very much against it. If by whiskey you mean that wonderful libation that makes life better, I'm for it. <laughs> so if by P3, you mean an, an arrangement that's entered into for the right reasons, and that reason is generally not to get money from the private sector, because it is not free money. Uh, we have a lot of people portraying P3s as if, oh, on one side we have massive amounts of infrastructure needs in the country. On the other side we have massive amounts of private capital. Put them together, it'll be like peanut butter and chocolate, and we'll be great. Um, that's not the way it works. We don't have any shortage of capital willing to invest in infrastructure. What we have is a shortage of revenue to pay it back. And so typically a P3 is not going to get you revenue. In fact, it may require more money than a publicly sponsored project, but it may create greater value. And the places where it's worked are places like um, the Port of Miami Tunnel in Florida. Uh, which was done on an, a long-term availability payment basis. Florida had to build a new tunnel. They hadn't built a tunnel in 50 years. They had a lot of technological risk involved in the project, a lot of concern if they'd done it the traditional way, you'd probably be seeing a lot of cost overruns because the developer would have said, your design is bad, and we, we did it, but it's not working. Um, and they probably would have had a lot of issues about future performance. Instead, they got an internationally recognized tunnel uh, contractor to do it. It's not necessarily going to be a toll tunnel, um, but they are going to be paying them not up front, you know, as I mentioned with the warranty issue, um, they're not going to get their compensation largely up front. It's going to be over 25 years. So if that tunnel were to fail, um, then we have somebody to look to and some resources uh, to fix it. That's a good project. Uh, there have been failures, but even, and I'm going to try to shorten this answer because I'll have to keep this answer to an answer. Um, <laughs> in some way, um, but but there's been you know even in this situation, people think of the Dulles Greenway as a failure, right? Because it went bankrupt, I think two or three times, you know. And the original uh, investor who built it uh, did lose money on it for sure. You know, they built the land before the project before the land got developed. Um, well, a couple things there: is it a failure for the public sector? We've got the road; we didn't have to use public money for it. From some, we would say that's a win for the public sector. Um, we got them to build a road we didn't have to pay for. Um, but the other factor is that landowner um, wanted to build that road for two reasons. One is um, they wanted to control where the alignment was and make sure it went to their properties and create better access for the other properties that they own. So they might have lost money on the toll road. We're still not sure if they've lost money on the overall uh, picture of the deal. Um, so it's very hard to define success and failure. What I would say is that we don't really uh, do a great job of, of determining success and failure now. When we compare public projects to private projects, we kind of do it the same way I used to do in high school physics, where you have the frictionless pulley and the weightless plane. You have the theoretically perfect public project. The reality is we have cost overruns and delays on the public side. And one of the greatest things about public partnerships is that you don't have those change orders and 
overruns, it is a single responsibility. So if you look at the estimate on the public side before the project starts, and you look at what it cost on the private side, yeah, it's probably going to be more on the private side, but you don't know what it really would have been if it had been done publicly. And I'll, I'll end there, but we could have a whole forum on just that topic alone. <laughs> yes, and I'll encourage succinct questions and succinct answers at this point. Hi, uh, Bill Roos. Uh, Mike, you mentioned that we've got more and more uh, buses now, school buses, art buses, as the population is increasing in the county, and it's going to be continuing to, to increase. Where are we going to park those buses? Um, right now, we, we actually, the county is invested in, in a piece of property in Shirlington um, for the art, home for art. We just opened up a uh, light maintenance facility on Eade Street. So between the Eade Street and Shirlington location that we're, uh, we've just acquired, uh, or we're just in the process of acquiring, that's the home for art right now. Um, there may be need for future expansion as we go closer to 90 buses by in the early 2020, 2022 timeframe. So that's the plan right now for um, art. School buses, that's still a work in progress, frankly, because we are, um, as we speak, we have buses at the Trade Center and we have buses at Shirlington um, at that same location where art's, art's at. So we're, we're, we're challenged right now where we're gonna find additional space for, for school buses. Right, and, and that's just the, the part of it. The other part is where do we get the parks, uh, that we're going to need for all the new people, where we're going to have the, the playing fields, where we're going to have the, okay. the back Thank office. You. Right. Right. Uh, Lynn, you, yes. uh, Jen, you uh, mentioned the five cities that you've studied and so forth. Give me one good idea from one of those cities that Arlington could use. Okay. There's an a interesting project creating a pedestrian network in Pittsburgh uh, with their stairways. Um, and this was sort of an approach to really mapping out the entire network as pedestrians. Um, uh, actually, green stormwater infrastructure, um, changing how it's uh, developed is the St. Paul idea. Um, and then resiliency bonds from uh, San Francisco seawall, um, looking at uh, helping to uh, protect against climate change, um, and then getting uh, the insurers to lower your premium and using that reduced premium because it, you have less chance of flooding in your system. Um, then you have a, a way to pay back uh, the bond that will pay for some of that reduced chance. So if you have, let's say, a facility in Arlington that's going to be prone to flood with sea level rise um, and you have an insurer, maybe they'll reduce your premium if you can uh, build some protective uh, infrastructure. Um, in San Francisco, they're looking at, in other coastal cities, they're looking at using those reduced premiums to actually pay for some of that infrastructure. I think that's the best innovation so far. That was really quick, so I'm going to take one more in the back, but just ask for it to be a brief question, brief answer, please. Mary Glass. Um, in uh, 2016, the county did a survey on open space and found that there's a very strong uh, interest in investing in green space, parklands, nature areas, and things like that. Um, how do we balance those? How do we get those as priorities because they're hard to measure? And how do we balance them against other needs? Uh, a good example being the stormwater program. To meet the Chesapeake goals, um, they use stream restoration, which then destroys a lot of trees. So how do you balance off and, um, and meet the needs okay. that Jen was talking about? Well, that's a, if, if I could answer that, I would probably not be here right now. Um, that, <laughs> That that's a ch tough challenge. I think it's it's going to take a lot of effort. Um, that's one of the reasons J JFAC was stood up to to look at those competing priorities um, of the t 26 square miles uh, that compose Arlington. Eight percent of it is public land. Sixty two percent of that is open space for parks. Um, only twelve percent of that is for back office uh, support for our infrastructure. So. You know, it, there's a balancing, and frankly, schools, parks, they're higher in the pecking order, I think, is a priority for the community, and we have to balance that with the operational space we need to deliver services. And I think that's the challenge that, from our department standpoint, that we constantly face, because frankly, if I ask for a show of hands of who wants to advocate for parks, schools, and DES infrastructure, um, I'm thinking that I, I know how that would come out. And so uh, it, it's, it's a constant challenge, but I think it involves the whole community, the board, the uh, advisory commissions that, and committees that we have to try to come up with those best solutions on how to balance those competing priorities. And just a quick answer, um, 
a lot of places with dense urban development, which Arlington is counted among, uh, really have looked at creative infrastructure reuse. We have a lot of highway infrastructure in this county. Um, you know, th places like the Highline Network, places like, um, you know, other, other places have found creative ways to maybe underground or reuse areas that may be surplus um, on road networks, especially if we uh, uh, are successful with all our TDM and travel demand management uh, efforts, we may find that you're able to do that. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing what innovations you'll have when I come back next time. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone.